Welcome to the Java user group event of tonight, Quark is the black swan of Java. Um, today we will have Max Anderson from Red Hat joining you to give the talks afterwards on YouTube. So if you haven't done that, if you haven't read the email from Ursula already, um, we have a new YouTube channel and um, we have more than 120 people signed up already, or even I think maybe close to 200. And um, we will keep these talks recorded there. So you can also watch them um, tomorrow or some other day, anyhow. Now, at the end of the talk, um, when we finish everything, you get forwarded to the feedback form. Please answer the feedback form. It's the same as you're used to, like during our regular talks, and you would provide us um, nice feedback. Right. And then you have to know, actually, we are running um, 15 seconds ahead of time. So there is some delay of the YouTube stream. And we know that when you're like chatting or asking questions, um, we have to wait a bit. So there is some, some delay going on. Um, you're already using um, the chat. So the chat is just like as you do right now, selling hello. Um, also, for example, mentioning if you have problem with um, audio or video, let, let us know because somebody will take care of that and they will help you to fix it. Don't use the chat for the regular questions for the presentation. For that part, we use the Q&A um, section. So please put your questions there. We will monitor that and um, we'll ask the questions in, in the talk. So I'll, I'll ask the questions to Max then, yes. Um, we will also send out some polls. So you will see some, some splash screen on top of your um, browser, and then you just have actually to vote. Right, so we have two questions set up for you. Yes, and then actually, that's the part where we start. And also we start with the first poll before Max is going um, to start his presentation. So the question would be, what is your knowledge level of Quarkus? So just send out the poll and let's wait a, a few seconds and then actually the result should pop up. So Max, you said that probably half of Red Hat is showing up. I, well, <laughs> we just have two committers <laughs> so <Awesome>. far. <laughs> that is good. Probably Alexei and me said yes. So I'll turn off my screen and you can take it from here. Cool. Uh -oh. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Voila. Okay, hi guys. I'm Max Anders from uh, from Red Hat, and uh, I'm very happy to be here at uh, the Swiss Jug. I was supposed to do it in live some at some point, but uh, the whole world is falling apart, so we do it this way. Um, I wanted to say that uh, I'm Max in Neuchatel, and I think there might be Alexei and Dimitris on the chat, who are uh, also uh, engineers in in the team on Focus, and they're also in Neuchatel in Switzerland. So. A big chunk of Quarkus is actually done uh, here in Switzerland, uh, in case you didn't know. So um, let me see. So anyway, let me get started my talk. So this is actually a picture that is very important. Uh, this is taken around March last year uh, on the day that Quarkus was announced. I was actually on a beach driving a bike, seeing a, a black swan for the first time in my life. Um, I was actually on sabbatical. Uh, taking some time off, and I had heard about this thing called Quarkus before, um, and that was actually released and announced on this uh, day I was on this lake uh, here in Neuchatel. Um, everyone was scattered, but I wasn't there, uh, and I joined the project later. So I heard about this uh, thing, uh, Quarkus, uh, while looking at Black Swan, and that's kind of why the talk is called Black Swan, but it's also this thing that's called the Black Swan Theory. 
Um, it is a, a thing from back in the 18, 1900s when people thought that there was only this white, uh, swans could only be white. A majestic animal, big and fluffy, and it will only be white. There will be no black or anything. And everyone was like very sure about it because they only observed white swans out there. Uh, but then people went to New Zealand and Australia, and there there's actually black swans. And suddenly all kind of how you, 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 you uh, as a bio biologist or genes researcher, looked at things changed. And you, so it came as a surprise. It had a major impact. It changed how a, a whole uh, industry. And afterwards, it was kind of like, well, of course you will have black swans. That's, you know, that's the most natural thing that has to be uh, that kind of thing. So that's, that's what the black swan theory is about. Um, and that's, I'll kind of show you why I think uh, Quarkus is uh, a, black a black swan in the whole uh, Java industry. Okay, so let's start. So here is a few things. Uh, and I generally ask what does not fit up here. I'll ask, answer for you that when you talk about OpenShift, Kubernetes, cloud native, microservice, serverless, you are thinking small pieces, small thing that runs around. And then Java is there. And that's not necessarily known to be a, a light thing to work with. Um, and what Quarkus does is actually trying to fix that. Uh, so when you normally run Java in, containers, uh, you have a hotspot or a VM mode, a VM server, and you can have like, you know, let's say a few in there and it has memory and the whole runs, but often you end up having that, hey, I could run no the same kind of application in a node and it will be uh, smaller and lighter. Or if I even go Goad, uh, Goad, Golang, uh, you can fit in even more. And that's been historically this problem of Java is great, we can run Java in our container but to do the same workload, I have to pay more to run the same thing in, in, than I can do in other frameworks. And um, another thing is that what Quarkus is focusing on is developers. So we've always had like these jokes and cartoons you might have seen before, like when you sit down and do a build, you, you know, the developer runs out and check, check Twitter or do thought fighting. Uh, what Quarkus does is try and fix that problem that hey, I, I want to make Java development joyful again, not having to wait for, for, for things to happen. Um, we furthermore is, uh, you know, you're mixing uh, imperative reactive. So you could, might be used to do imperative programming and you're fine with that. You can use Quarkus. You might be into doing everything reactive because your business or area is better suited for it. You can do that. Or if you want to do one or another uh, in different area of your program, you can do that too. Um, and the whole idea is that we try to kind of re take a fresh look at the APIs out there and make them available both in imperative and reactive. <clears throat> and furthermore, Quarkus is new. Uh, well, it's yeah, well, it's still new, but uh, uh, it's now over a year since we announced it. Uh, but uh, it's very important to realize that the actual thing that runs, the thing that actually does all the logic and thing you're used to, is night. Oh, 90 or 80 percent good old existing code so we use hibernate it's you know the most mature persistent engine out there we use apache camel for integration uh, again 10 15 years of of, of, of development um uh, Nady is a well-known uh web server and then of course we fit into kubernetes and uh, jaeger and tracing and prometheus and the whole thing so it's very important to realize that even though quarkus is new it holds the the thing that actually does all the work is very solid, uh, solid and best of breed frameworks out there. And to be very clear, I'm going to show you how this works. I have here my screen. Let me switch over so you can see it. There, I just have a little directory, and I'm going to create a project. So we have a Maven command to create a project. Um, you can also create Gradle products if you want to. I'm just gonna use the main one because of the ones I'm used to. Um, it runs and generates this program. And we go in and we should have uh, demo. And we'll just go uh, Maven, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> focus dev. So what I'm doing is what we call dev mode. It builds a project and starts it up. And it will take a little bit of time because it has to compile the whole thing and run. 
So this is not sure why this is taking so long. <laughs> there we go. That was very slow. Three seconds. Let me do that again. That was that was not good. Maybe it's because I'm doing my sharing here. Okay. For some reason they want to, it normally takes about one or two seconds. Um, there we go. And here is my app. And there's a little endpoint here. It says hello. And very simple and nothing special. I'm gonna just start my editor on it. <clears throat> so this is VS Code. Um, you can use any IDE. You can use Notepad or Emacs or IntelliJ. And we actually have tooling for uh, all of them, except Notepad. Uh, here we go. Voila. So here is the code that does the hello. So I can go and say, hello, Doug. Voila. And something is taking a lot of CPU. There we go. So if you, what had happened here, I changed the code. In the background, the compile uh, went off, and it was changed uh, very quickly. But there was a little delay. I blame that on the on the streaming. But uh, the idea is you can also just change code here. Let's just say hello, Max. I'll um, I'll put that here in a. Uh, I'll just do a method here. Uh, just say hello. Who? Let me do public string. Oops. So again, I'm just writing a thing here. I'm just typing along, saving, and yeah, that's a noticeable delay. It changes again. So <clears throat> again, very small app. Uh, but I didn't have to start or stop anything. It just changed. Any change I do over the code here reflects in the program. Uh, but this little demo thing is not uh, interesting. Let's go more full stack here. So I have a, a bigger to-do app here, which is you know, originally not just a to-do. I'm going to run this again, and we'll see if that one's faster. And again, this will build the app, run up. And it's clearly not as fast as it should be. There we go. So, oh, that was zoomed in quite a lot. So here is the, ah, actually, well, that doesn't matter. Um, my little to-do app here, uh, we'll just say welcome testing slow machine uh, with corpus. It's a little to-do. And the thing is, this is actually a full app. It is a full stack app that is using. i show in two seconds. All right, this machine still. So anyway, the, the, it's a full app. So there's a, a view uh, front end that goes through a to-do app that is uh, loading uh, entities and Hibernate. And a database is running uh, on the back end as a, uh, what's it called, uh, a Postgres uh, running. Uh, so it's a full, full stack app. And in here, I can go and say, for example, I had the title was uh, uppercase. I'm just going to say that should just be normal. Let me go over here and refresh. And the thing is, it only got, it's going to do the recompile and restart when I hit the refresh button. It's not, when I do the changes, it doesn't do anything. Meaning that, uh, which, which in normal, like hot reload situation, it, it keeps updating. Uh, in our case, we only do it when necessary. Um, and again, I just change the code and, and off we go. Um, 
I can also hit a debugger. I'm not going to do that right now because for some reason my machine is overloading. But uh, you can put a breakpoint and step in through it uh, as you can. But the thing that's worth noting is just the fact that you can change um, all the things you have uh, in here. So for example, if I wanted to have, let's see if this will start. I have here the application properties, which are showing all the settings that are available for my app. Um, I can, for example, do I have open API? I have that included. Um, so if I put that here, oh, that was the wrong one I want to do. I wanted to do the, I want to do the swagger one. So where is the, Did I put the wrong one? Oh, there we go. I'm just going to cheat. <laughs> Here, if I now go to Swagger UI, there is, we have this included. If you enable Open API on your app, then you can see this. And again, if I change the settings, I put that in here. I'm literally changing a setting. I hit the refresh. In the background, the recompiler happens. And you see it, it was the wrong one because now it's called so that creates. So again, in this case, I literally, when it on request, the app was shut down, booted up again with Hibernate JPA and the whole stack and changed the, the routing. And this was done in milliseconds. Like right? It's so fast that I can't even switch f uh, fast enough between the, 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 the apps here. Um, so now it's going to be interesting because the, the next thing we want to talk about is, is uh, how to do stuff like native. So here is the app. And I'm just going to do uh, start the build. And hopefully, my machine will let me, me do that. So while we wait for that, we step over. So here we go. So it's building in the background a native. And we'll come back to how that works. So that was, again, short on like, how Quarkus work. That, like What I showed you is so fast it runs. You just create your app. You edit it, and it reloads on the fly. OK. And um, so why Quarkus? So the Quarkus name is kind of like the quark as the small elementary particle. It's a small thing. And us is what we call the hardest thing in the computer science is uh, dealing with us and humans. Um, we want to have the developer joy. Uh, I showed one thing here was the fast reload. Uh, the other was the configuration. I showed you the application properties where every configuration we do, we kind of put in there. Uh, one uh, thing we do in Quarkus that others might not do is that we don't actually just expose every feature from the frameworks. So for example, when we made uh, Hibernate support for Quarkus, we said, hey, we, have a, we now have a, a, a possibility to simplify Hibernate configuration and, and what options we ha have there. So uh, the access you actually have uh, for the setup you do for Hibernate Quarkus is way simplified, but it's also focused on the stuff that we, we've seen people use now in the last you know, uh, three or four years, rather than how Hibernate was used when it was created 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and that same goes with all the other frameworks. And it's in one place, and it's documented, and it's, uh, it's much more streamlined than, than having to go and configure each individual plugin on itself. Uh, OK, I get. I can see there's some that can't see the video very well. I hope that it will get better. Um, so anyway, the and the thing is, we try and make all this uh, experience from a developer point uh, as seamless as possible. And uh, for example, the stuff we're going to talk about, the native generation, if you try and do that with other frameworks, you there's a lot of things you have to do, uh, deal with. Quarkus kind of packages that up, and it's literally just as I showed you. I just kicked off a native build. Um, so yeah, so what we are doing is, uh, besides getting giving developer joy, we want uh, to try and make Java relevant where you have the monolith. You can write monolith apps with Quarkus. We don't recommend it, but as you can. Uh, and then when you start splitting up more and more, uh, the thing is, when you go from monolith to functions or microservices, the startup time starts becoming the important part. 
if you watch a monolith, it's more like, oh, ca can I run for a long time? Can I have a high throughput? You're less worried about the startup time. Um, but when you start doing function and microservices, startup time is essential. To you don't want to have to wait for uh, you know four or five or ten, twenty or minutes uh, to have the first response. You want to be up uh, immediately. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and the thing is, the uh, thing about Java is that it's kind of over the years, it's like twenty five years old now, has just. We've had this VM that is amazing. It's actually, what it does is actually amazing. But uh, we've, uh, the VM is designed for throughput. So we can do a lot of requests. And the thing is, there are to load up, we have to pass the classes, we have to look at the bytecode, there has to be just some JIT going on. And uh, the thing takes space, so it takes uh, room. <coughs> And one of the things that happened when we actually looked at improving Java, we asked the OpenDDK team, which uh, is part of Red Hat, uh, that like, can you guys make OpenDDK faster because it's you know it's obviously OpenDDK that's going slow. And the response that came back was, well, guys, you just stop using that many classes because if you just have fewer classes, it'll be faster to boot. So there was like a direct correlation between how many classes your app has and how fast the startup is, which is you know kind of obvious when you think about it. Um, and the, the awesome thing, well, the, the bad thing is that in Java with things like Spring or CDI or Hibernate or um, any modern framework the last 10, 15 years has based itself on reflection and uh, dynamic configuration and load ups and just automatic wiring things together. And that takes a lot of space. Like that metadata takes a lot of space. And uh, so again, back to the problem. We end up having these big uh, VMs, even though they may have have small uh, piece of code. Um, but it, with Quarkus, you're getting from having a traditional kind of cloud native stack. Uh, you have a doing a basic stuff. You might have 140 megs in in resident memory. With Quarkus running in VM mode, you can have that. And if you go supersonic, super atomic with native. Uh, you, you're down to like nothing. It's uh, what's this? Just like a se uh, one seventh uh, of the size in this example. Um, and this is just for the basics. But even if you do a full app kind of thing, like the app gets big, like the scale is about the same. Um, so this really matters when you start doing interesting uh, bigger things. Uh, and one is memory, one is startup time. You go from uh, 9.5 down to you know 0.05 seconds. I'll hope to show that in a few seconds. <coughs> and uh, the other thing is that when we use Quarkus, you end up with that uh, we actually are smaller than a, no a corresponding Node.js application. And Go can still do a bit more native tricks, uh, and they can they will take up a little more space, but that is, you know, considered for me at least uh, a small price to pay for actually having access to a full Java API, uh, which is, you know, it means you don't have to learn uh, Go or you can just stay and use Java and for all the goodness that's coming there in, 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 in the future of Java. So, um, there you go. And of course, uh, I didn't show that in a demo, but uh, here, for example, is just. You can mix and match the reactive and, and unified. Uh, and my machine is there. And again, the best uh, uh, different frameworks. And I'm hopefully waiting for, yeah. So I've been either talking too fast or too slow. Well, not too slow. Uh, there we go. And. Curious why this is stuck. Well, like, have you had so, um, Patrick? Has there been any questions so far? Because I'm just waiting for this thing compiled to complete. Nothing. <laughs> Question. Actually, Dima asks. Huh. 
Um, any good resources, uh, tips on how to migrate an existing boot application to Quarkus? There we go. Now change. So, okay. So anyway, I'll uh, hopefully this this should not take more than a few minutes, but uh, it's taking a lot of time. Um, so anyway, so what is happening now is I'm using uh, GraalVM to uh, do this build. And the GraalVM is uh, uh, a technology done by the Oracle Group. Uh, actually, a lot of them are in CERC. Um, and what it does, it take, we, we give the full Java app to uh, GraalVM, and it starts processing these uh, classes and out comes a native binary. Um, and normally this takes about six, four or five minutes, because where before I could do a very quick turnaround in a few seconds, here uh, this thing takes time. And I will have to go. I'll have to go back to the. Let's see. Now I'll get started. It might just. It just finished. Great. <laughs> here we go. So this took eight. Minutes and 58. Normally, it's like four minutes. Again, there's something with my lovely machine. So there we go. So here you'll see in the target folder, uh, there is the, the jars were the ones that we kind of used before. And there's this executable. It's red. It's an executable file. So when I run this, I actually... Again, yeah, 0 0.1. You saw a little delay here. So again, this 0 0.1 is still good for Java. I would expect it to see 0, 0.0 something. Um, I'm going to show you that it's running here. So this is the native app uh, running in production mode. So that there's no testing data. Testing running executable. And the very nice thing here is I'll, I'm going to show you. Here we go. Oop. Zoom in for you guys. I have here it's running. So you see it's actually running in 4.6. That's weird. <laughs> I, I don't. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> Stop running. Let me just do this thing. Um, so what I'm going to do, just to show that this uh, thing uh, scales up, I'm going to run, and you'll see now if my machine completely dies. Let me just. I'm not so optimistic now. I'm just going to run 50 instead of 100. So I'm going to run 50. Um, uh, apps uh, on different ports, and it starts up, and and pay pours eight thousand. That's an app. So this is this is from port eighty. Oh, sorry, eight thousand. And I'm gonna do let's say the fifty one from port eighty fifty, and I'm just gonna do the thirty four. From 8034. So this was me starting 50 full stack Java apps running Hibernate and the whole shebang. And hopefully now this should show. There we go. They're all here. Um, and the number is a bit weird, but anyway, they're running on there's 150 instances running on my machine. Uh, in like what was that? Like a under under a second to start up. And I could jump between them. They're fully running. It's not like no caching anything. These are fully um, uh, fu fully running uh, applications. So there's no cheating about oh we have to we start up very quickly and then lazy load the whole thing. No, it's actually happening uh, as we speak. And again, I'm sorry for a little bit of delay uh, on the compilation, but that's again the point. That's the power of the native uh, setup. That we can get those startup times and that low memory uh, performance. Yeah, Marcus says I'm on, I'm actually on a new Mac, so uh, it's a bit weird. So anyway, um, but how does this actually happen? What is it that makes the Quarkus thing work? 
and that's the uh, when I joined the, the 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 project, I had heard about it before, um, and how it works. But I, there was a number one question people asked me, like, why is it that Quark is so special? And um, so, uh, what you normally do in a normal uh, framework or app development is you have your at build time, you package your stuff, you use Maven and Gradle, and and, and do your thing, and then at runtime, you have to you know load some configuration file to see what you need to do or you need to start loading the classes um, on the class path, uh, scan them through and look for annotations. The, the VM has to load them in and have to wire up whatever model we have, for example, for Hibernate, like which entities fits together, and generate the SQL, and then we get to run that. And it does that every time you run. It's kind of when you think about it, going back to like what you used to and what you're used to seeing and what you can do. It's like, it feels stupid. Why are we, every time we run, are we doing these things again and again? Um, and yeah, well, Quarkus flips it around. That all this stuff about analyzing the model and uh, scanning the classes, we do at build time. Meaning at runtime leaves very little left. And that not only gives that awesome startup time, but uh, in production, but it also gives you uh, at development time, the fact that we can restart so fast uh, comes from the fact that we already done this processing at build time. So every time we do a change, we only have to uh, react to the, the, the delta, and we don't have to do any magic tricks of like J Rebel of, of modifying the class path. We literally just take the app down and put, put it up again, um, and that means that there's no tricks needed. Uh, we actually thought we had to, but we didn't. Uh, so that means even if we get to a point where the larger apps starting to be more heavy, we, we haven't seen that yet. But if they do, we still have more tricks we can do. But the the whole like th that whole thing to understand where Quarkus it does differently is it moves everything to build time, um, and and that just has this amazing effect. Um, and <clears throat> the thing we uh, uh, well the one thing that to realize here is opposite to other frameworks which does everything, the wiring and stuff on runtime, we do it at build time. And not only do we have like a single place if we do it at build time, we have a whole very, um, uh, a whole model of how we go through the phases of preparing for the build, analyzing the classes, analyzing the model, load uh, uh, like uh, the classes and, and prepare. And what we actually do is we tell every framework, hey, go and do your thing and give us the states you want us to replicate when you start. And we put that into, um, like, you can see it as like a static list slicer and store it in the class. And then when we load, it just loads the class and run through. Like, there's no dynamic stuff. It's just all static. And uh, that makes a huge difference. Um, and when we get to native, it has an even bigger, uh, bigger impact. So, um, anyway, so the thing is, we have all these uh, phases in build time. And we let these extensions uh, do their thing. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the thing, but there's the there's this, like rest easy and native, all these extensions on top. And then there's these base uh, features like the Quarkus core. Jandex is an index for uh, classes. So we don't do annotation uh, processing or normal uh, class loading. We, we use this index we have that make, happens at build time. So we have a, a much faster index to look things up. Um, Gives me is the, the byte generator, and Graal SDK is the, the, the Graal VM we use. And then we can either deploy that on, I'm going to remove myself here, uh, deploy that on a JDK on, or a Graal VM. And I'll, I'll repeat this again. Quarkus is not just about Graal VM. Quarkus is a lot of stuff that is useful on pure VM without Graal. Graal is the thing that makes it go the extra mile of being supersonic. But if you don't want to use a native, you can and just do it on full VM. OK. So, so let me, uh, these extensions, like the question is like, how, what, what kind of extensions uh, do we have? So I'm going to go here on co-quarkers. So co-quarkers is uh, a page we uh, have. and. The thing you do here is actually the same you can use for the command line. I'm just going to show it here because it highlights the thing you can do. So for example, if you want to know, we had the open API. Uh, 
that's that one the small right open the eye if eye if you want to do spring uh we have a, um, a compatibility layer for spring on like the defense injection the data security uh, web uh jdbc uh various different drivers so the thing here to to note for example is there's a few missing here like uh, db2 and oracle that is not because they can't do it you can actually use quarkus with oracle and db2 in java mode but if you want to do the native stuff uh their drivers has not yet been updated we've worked we know they work it's just a time matter of quite quite time when they want to release it uh, but any uh, open source database, PostgreSQL, MariaDB, MySQL, oh, the SQL Server, all of the drivers have been open source where we could go and see what needs to be done and either write an extension that made it happen or fix the driver so it behaves well. Because that's one of the things when you uh, work with GraalVM, um, it's very important that you don't do weird reflection. So for example, I forgot which driver it was. Let's say it's MariaDB. It actually had in its driver, uh, it loaded Java AWT and Spring classes to show a dialog in case you didn't have the username password set. Uh, like that, this makes no sense to load that whole subsystem of classes. Um, and that's a good that's a good example of, of things we found when we did these extensions. We find things where people like they're so used to stuff just being loaded at runtime, uh, and they haven't been careful on what they do. And when in Quarkus. We, when we see something load slow, uh, like and slow for us is like a few hundred milliseconds is 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 slow. Uh, it's often because people are loading just too much because they used to do everything at at, at runtime. Um, so anyway, the you can choose these different uh, apps uh, apps extensions. Uh, I can have you know Hibernate, Validator, ORM, and I can go generate my uh, app, download as a zip, or if you want to push it right to GitHub, you can do that too. Um, or if you want to share this configuration with someone, you can do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, the point here is the extensions. The whole extension uh, ecosystem is there. Uh, we are doing everything we can to expand it. We are doing all the big things that we find important. Uh, but it's also in the community and now started to be people doing uh, uh, additional things for these. <clears throat> so. So one thing was to get the the build phase covered and have extensions uh, for every framework. Then comes how does the the Graal VM um, work? So uh, at the Graal VM, it can do um, uh, it, it compiles and 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 process the the jars. When I run the native uh, image uh, demo or compile, you saw all these phases where it actually compile and runs the thing. Um, and that is a lot of analyzing of the classes, of which dependencies are in the VM, uh, what are in the DDK, what's in your app, and then see which which methods and classes we can uh, uh, we, we not uh, which code we are not actually executing. So Quarkus actually does a lot of stripping out just stuff like Hibernate. Oh, we don't want to support this thing in Hibernate. We just don't load those classes at uh, at runtime, uh, or if uh, what else uh, in uh, camel we, we make sure that every module only at when you do the build time we have all the logic to build out the model but at runtime we don't we just need the result we don't need all the parsing that means we can all the configuration and all these classes doesn't have to load so even before we get to graal vm open the, uh, in crocus we can actually strip things out and make the vm mode more light uh, but to go to the next level and actually go and strip out methods and lines of code that never get reached, that's where GraalVM goes in. Um, and there's a lot of low-level, dirty configuration of GraalVM that is can be quite complicated. Uh, but Quarkus does that for you. So you don't actually see, you don't have to see it uh, unless you want to write an extension. Um, so, you know, there's all these wonders of GraalVM, which is, is true, but it ha it comes with a price. Um, so, for example, you can't do dynamic class loading, uh, so because the classes aren't there. They, if, if they haven't been reached, they are not. Uh, they're not any code to use them. We just remove them, and even if they were there, there's no mechanism to kind of on the fly generate uh, a, a native compilation and, and load it. Um, there are something you you might expect you can't do, like for example, reflection. I didn't know that GraalVM could do reflection. Uh, 
you know, in the past. Uh, but uh, you can now if you manually configure it. Um, and the cool thing is when we do, uh, for example, you have you load your custom user classes. Uh, what Quarkus does that, so we'll, let me back, go back. If you had to take your own app and put that into uh, a Graal VM, you'll have to list the dynamic stuff you do. <coughs> but Quarkus knows the framework you use, like Hibernate and Vertex, et cetera. So we actually know a lot of classes that should be added. So we automatically go to Graal and say, hey, by the way, the user is using this in these places. Please add them to, to, to your set. And therefore, the configuration becomes almost trivial for you, like non-existent. You don't have to care. Um, so anyway, so the, the thing is, there, there are some limits you can't do. Um, another one is you can't um, uh, do like debugging and monitoring. And I actually want to show here that, yeah, that's the slide. Um, so on, on GraalVM, you get um, you know very fast startup time. Um, you, you can have, uh, what's it called? Um, you have more density, you can fill in, the, the, the it takes up less space. On the VM, you get more th uh, higher throughput over time. Um, so if you're running a thing for a long time, maybe VM mode is for you. Um, and uh, and you don't, uh, all the tooling you do for monitoring and debugging exists for VM. Anything you do for Java, you can use there. On Graal VM, it's slightly different. So I have this little drawing that, that kind of shows when you want to use both because you, you want to do it, right? Um, so in the, the developer joy, for example, is very high on VM, what I showed you. Uh, in Graal VM, it's very low because you know, it's six minutes for a compile, et cetera. So that's something you'll do on a CI server. Um, but for example, the monitoring is uh, excellent on, on OpenDTK. On VM uh, native image, it's not a non-existent because you can use all the existing like uh, Prometheus and uh, all the monitoring tool or any native tool to monitoring. Um, I will say that we're actually adding actually um, a flight recorder support to native image, so it will be better over time. Uh, other things there, like the the startup time is of course is better for for uh, Graal VM, and again then there's a difference between do you want to have a high peak throughput or do you want to have a Small memory, so you have, have have more high density. It all depends on your application. And the important thing to know is just Quarkus lets you do both, uh, or and, Quark, uh, and you can choose between doing VM mode or, or Graal. <clears throat> OK. Um, anyway, the other things I wanted to talk to you about um, is uh, other, uh, if you want to do um, Quarkus for, for you know, you do want to do, use Quarkus for other things, one of the things we, we have is we have uh, uh, testing. Uh, so uh, like the dev mode, we've done optimization. So the testing uh, works very well with both native and VM mode. So you have full access to injection and dependency, dependency injection. And it's not like you had to mock everything out uh, to get started. It's a full start every time. Uh, which is fine in most cases because it's it's so fast. Um, we have uh, this Panache API for um, that is a layer on top of Hibernate that makes us strip out a lot of the the, the boilerplate code uh, you, you can have. So if you're used to uh, Hibernate JPA, you can do that just fine. But we have what we consider like an improvement in in Quarkus. You can try out. <coughs> um, I think I'm running out of time, but let me show you just very quickly because I know a lot of people oh, has this. So we have what, what's called a compatibility layer of, um, of Spring. So uh, the code I've, well, the small amount of code you've seen has been uh, standard uh, JPA code or code that we would write in, in Quarkus, which we believe is a bit more simpler and more um, uh, optimized. But you can use, for example, Spring. So here is a, a full Quarkus app, just similar as, as before, uh, but it's using, you see, there's no JavaX entity, there's no Hibernate, there's no anything magic. This is just pure Spring uh, wiring up. And I see here there's the uh, greeting service, the beans factory stereotype, all the stuff you need for Spring. This is stuff you can run on Quarkus. 
It is not running Spring because Spring is kind of this white swan. It does everything dynamically at runtime, and that means it's never going to be Quarkus subatomic speed. Um, they can do some things, but not at the level we can do. Um, so that's why we have this layer that allows you to use the existing API you're used to um, and, and, and get ahead. OK. Anyway, I want to conclude the, the talk and say that Quarkus is, I see that it's the black swan of Java because it kind of flips everything around what you assume about uh, Quarkus. Oh, sorry, but not Quarkus, but Java. You can do fast development, like it's PHP, Node.js uh, speed of, of turnaround. You have these massive uh, uh, improvements on startup time when you use GraalVM. Uh, the APIs, we didn't talk much about it here, but the APIs is simpler. We allow you to get access to um, uh, reactive and imperative at the same time. And again, it's not like we are, we are coming to a full new thing. Uh, we're using best of breed in, in different uh, libraries and standards. So yeah, that's why I met the Swarm back in, in March last year. And that's the day the Quarkus was born uh, into the world. Um, and uh, yeah, that kind of concludes my my talk. So, Patrick, is there questions? <laughs> so I'm with the audio, like during your talk. So I'm happy oh. to now again. Um, Dima asked, okay. actually, are there any good resources, tips on how to migrate an existing Spring Boot app to Quarkus? Uh, yeah. So we have, I don't, actually, it's a specific migration. So uh, we have on um, uh, Quarkus IO, there is a user guide on how to do the, the um, uh, how to use a Spring uh, API. And then uh, we have one or two talks uh, of um, uh, Georgius, uh, like a YouTube video. He's done a presentation on how to walk through and how you do the conversion. Uh, I, I can make sure and give them to you and then can share it out on the, on the mailing list after. So uh, there we have some YouTube videos. And we have a few user stories of people migrating, uh, like real companies uh, doing it and moving over. But that's more like an overview kind of thing. So I think the videos are the ones that are best. But I, I can I can find it and send it out for you guys. OK, cool. Um, Peyti is asking, is there any Kotlin support? Yes, there is. So I didn't even touch, about, uh, touch on that. So let me just uh, show you. Where did my code quarks go? So you can see that here. Um, that's actually Kotlin. So one of the extensions is Kotlin. Um, and uh, it gives you uh, language support. So you can write your uh, app, Quarkus app in Kotlin. And the app you're watching right now is actually written in, Quar uh, in, in Quarkus and Kotlin. Um, so the code Quarkus app is actually, the I think, the biggest app we know that, that is um, open source and written in Kotlin. We also have Scala, uh, so that Kotlin and Scala can be done. I was kind of hoping we'll get a Groovy too, but uh, uh, hasn't been uh, done yet. But uh, yeah, there is uh, mechanics for, for, for doing that. That's nice. So um, Tobias is asking, um, how does Quarkus relate to Micronaut? So uh, OK, so Micronaut came out uh, a bit before. Uh, the team actually wasn't aware that much about Micronauts, but Micronaut does some of the same kind of things. Uh, but it has it's more um, um, uh, what's it called? Um, it's more focused on on some of the the the, the, the Spring uh, re-implementing some of the Spring APIs. So so uh, if you're used to Spring, it, it's kind of there. But um, Quarkus is a bit more wide and 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 performance-wise, we believe it's uh, the, the things we do, uh, they don't do as much the optimization uh, to make sure it can actually run in these small, small scale things. Um, so it's, it's a it's a competing framework basically, uh, but which doing some of the similar ahead of time completion stuff. Okay, but probably just also as you said more lightweight then, and uh, yeah, yeah, okay. well, so it's not more more lightweight than Quarkus, but Micronaut has some of the same. Uh, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's a similar kind of framework. Okay. So F is asking, how does AOT compile time scale with the size of the project? 
a time is already quite a long time for it to do that. Uh, so yes. So um, actually, quick question. I haven't. I don't actually know the exact numbers, but uh, generally, it doesn't. Uh, it's kind of the number of classes you have in your projects, but it's more about memory. Um, so the example I've seen is like a full-grown app maybe takes 10 to 20 minutes to build and requires uh, four or five gigs. So we, we recommend to run with five gigs because that seemed to be enough. Um, but um, so it, it, there is an overhead, but it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, uh, what's it called? It doesn't, it's, it's a constant overhead. It's not uh, exponential or that kind of thing. Um, but it, the, the, the flow is intended to be uh, in a CI server. And you also have to remember that um, most apps you do in this world will also be smaller. So you wouldn't take your big giant monolith and put it into this world. Um, so anyway, there is an overhead, but it's not, you know, it's not uh, monstrous. And we are trying to work on improving it. OK. So um, Chris is asking, um, does debugging work with the native app? Good question. So um, uh, yes and no. So right now, uh, the Graal VM uh, uh, called the Graal Community Edition does not have debug support. Um, and let me talk, talk debug support here. It's not like Java debugging because there's no the, there's no VM to 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 help you there. Uh, but for example, the uh, Graal Enterprise Edition has debug support via uh, GDB. So if you use Eclipse or IntelliJ with a good um, native debugger, it will actually work on, on, on uh, Graal's enterprise version. But uh, in master of Graal VM, uh, our OpenJDK team actually contributed debug support. So soon, I don't know when, but soon, uh, there will be a release of Graal that has initial support for doing debugging. Um, and it, you will be able to step through Java code uh, and, and deeper if you want to. Um, so it will it it is on its way in the community edition of Graal. But would that also mean you have to add some additional debug information into the native images, so that the compiler uh, or the debugger knows where it stands in the code? Uh, no. So I, I actually uh, by default we that is included. Okay. So this is this is the problem is that Graal community edition was not including that information in the output. Now it does. So that's the. Okay. Uh, but you were saying that the enterprise edition did before already. Yes, because that's a diff. That's okay. th that's a they they had that as an enterprise feature in Oracle, uh, and and it's an add-on. So the when you use that compiler, it will include those um, debug symbols, and what uh, Andrew Din on our and and a few other guys on on the OpenDK team and Red Hat did was to, uh, without looking at like they didn't have access to the thing, just implement it for 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 Graal. Uh, community edition. So, and that's in there. That's one of the big thing we, we we've done here lately. Yeah, Daniel is asking if the memory usage is still significantly lower than Spring Boot after effective use of everything you have in the application. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So the where is the? Um, I mean, this is what I'm trying to show here. The uh, at the beginning, I had this the, the drawing about the scale of things here, right? This here is, is this is the this is showing an usage of the app um, over some time, and um, so. But the thing is, I must say that depending on your app, you you will see different behavior. Uh, so over a long time, the VM mode will might be be better, uh, but if he's asking for like a Spring app, then uh, a Spring Boot app is um, will always keep taking 20, 30, 40 seconds to start up. And when you run, there is just more, I'm not going to say garbage, there's just more overhead the way they have in there. It's so the same if you have a Wildfly app, it has the same thing. It's it's just loaded too much. When Quarkus thing has been trimmed down and the, the general APIs are more lightweight. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So Eric is asking, how can configuration be done for several stages like development and production? Yes. So I will let me just switch to your screen here. 
So that file I showed you, application properties. Let's see, where's my, let me take the other example I have. Here we go. So this is this configuration. So Quarkus is the, the prefix for every setting. So everything that comes out of Quarkus is a, um, you know, a property. And then if you want to do production, so, so these are the production settings. So if you want to do uh, something only in development mode, um, you put like percentage dev in front here. And uh, whoop, there we go. And now it's in dev, it's in the dev profile. Uh, and you'll see here, oh, I actually forgot to comment it. The, the, I have a CLI uh, thing here. So one of the things we actually, uh, so anyway, to, ask, to answer your question, uh, we have profiles like dev, product, and test. And um, there's a, they, they default when you when you run test, it runs in test profile. When you run in dev mode, run dev mode. Um, and you can use the prod mode to anything product specific, and then it has a fallback. So there, there are these, like which you used to in other, uh, like Spring Boot and stuff, have a similar notion. Um, and what I just wanted to highlight here, because I, I forgot to mention it, is in Quarkus 1.4, one of the big news we have is that we can now run CLIs. Uh, so if you want to have uh, a CLI uh, for your app, you can do that. So you can have a main method. You can run your um, your thing. Um, that actually is one of the new features of, of 1.4. And the cool thing is that actually also have dev mode. So you can run the command line in dev mode and do your changes and press Enter, and it sends the same arguments again, and it runs again and again. So, um, yeah, that was just... The reason why I mentioned it because I have that in the, the application properties. So that's the way you have profiles to uh, mix these up. Can you also use an environment variables? Uh, yes. So I forgot the I forget the semantics right now. But when you look up a config variable, um, you will uh, it 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 will actually uh, be looked up in in the you know, system properties, environment variables, um, the application properties. Uh, we also have uh, integration with um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Haswell, or what's it called? Uh, a vault uh, for HesiCorp and secrets and config maps in uh, Kubernetes. So uh, you should be covered for most cases. And um, Pete is asking um, if you can use Chook in Quarkus as well. If I can use what? Sorry? Chook. That's a, a, a library which helps you to generate type safe SQL. Ah, so I don't, oh, Juke, oh, J, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you can. So, um, uh, the, um, yeah, so Joe, uh, yeah, so no, it can because the, um, actually, so I'll, I'll say, it. yes, you can because it's just a Java library and uh, I, so, you can use it in VM mode. I haven't tested yet if it works in native. I think it does. But so uh, I know it works in VM mode. Uh, its functionality works perfectly fine with Hibernate, or you can do your own thing. We don't have a Quarkus extension uh, dedicated for it yet. Uh, but it's one of those I, I definitely have on my list of, of looking into, because I don't think it should take much effort to do. Um, but yes, yeah, Duke, Duke can be used as a, as a Java library. I'm also sure. Otherwise, um, Lucas will provide you an extension for it for sure. Yeah, we'll so see. he's a maintainer <laughs> of the project. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Sorin has a question. He asks, "Are there any synergies uh, with Project Laden, which was recently announced this week? I think. Um, uh, yeah. They are. It looks quite a lot of overlapping <laughs> under the hoods, like static image being one. Yes. So yeah, Laden was announced like uh, last week, so uh, or this week maybe. Um, no, so it it, it does. Uh, so Laden is related to uh, Graal VM more than Quarkus. So Quarkus, the way Quarkus is written, uh, it can use anything that can generate like the native image part. So um, we expect that once Laden is is out there. You can choose between if you want to use Graal VMs or Layton. Uh, that's based on the current description. We don't have all the details. It's a very new project. Uh, but what Layton does is actually verifying that the ideas we're doing has is worth doing at an OBJK level. Um, so I don't know if people know, but uh, if anyone tried GC like uh, G 
GC for Java was both. The, in, in the past, there was an experiment to make Java compile bytecode. That was actually done by Andrew Din and, and the team that we had in Red Hat. Um, and it never really completed because the OpenDK was not really, at that time, open for that year. And over time, we, we, you know, we found the VM got faster. It wasn't a big deal. But then Container came, and Graal VM has been doing all this work for years. Um, but then we just kind of discovered Graal VM. They came up with a native image feature, like a, I can't remember, a year or two ago. And we realized, hey, we can use this and actually full. If we do this, we get a better VM mode and apply Graal, and we have the subatomic thing. So the, the thing what it does, Layton, is actually verifying that the ideas that we have, uh, both on the Quarkus team and Graal VM team especially, is worth making part of Open Data K. Um, and if you read the, the the statement that came out, is a bit funky because it says it's free. It's like no, we don't want to have Gravium here at all. Uh, but it's that is I don't think that's kind of not what's going to happen because the Gravium and the Open Data K team will work together on finding something where hopefully they can do good things for Open Data K, and Gravium can implement that spec. Um, and then there will be differences in between the VMs or, or compilers. Uh, so we see it as a good thing. Um, but it's just worth noting, don't wait for Layton to come out. Because Layton, it's you know, 2000, uh, it's like uh, Java 15 or 17, which is still years out before it becomes publicly available. Um, so anyway, th there is a relationship. Um, and as far as I know, it's a good relationship between teams. And I'm, uh, I'm uh, Happy to see, see it uh, come uh, come alive. Cool. We have some more questions actually to go sure. because they are like constantly asking questions, and that's really uh, awesome. Uh, uh, by the way, do, before we go, can you ask the QA question about the Java eight? So uh, I can actually send out a poll if you like. Yes, yeah. you can say something so, about it. So uh, one of the things we have uh, Quarkus right now supports uh, Java eight and eleven. Uh, we default to Java eleven, um, but we have a really high wish of of could, could start doing stuff with uh, some of the uh, libraries that are in the JDK 11, and just all the security and speed improvements that are in Java 11, we really want to benefit from. So I'm just curious if if uh, you're going to try out Quarkus, would Java 8 be a requirement for you in whatever environment you're in? Um, so that's the that's my question. Um, no, I'll, I'll do that one. You're then... <laughs> yes. So we have already over seventy responses. They're still like coming in, okay. and but it looks like it's like something like seventy to thirty percent or so. Okay. Yes. Cool. Anyway, you had you had more questions, so let's go. Yes. Um, um, Christian asks a really nice question regarding observability, observability tools like Prometheus. So yes. do you have like some support there, even, for example, in the native image mode? Yes. No. So I, I wanted to have shown that because, but because I had the problem, I didn't. But uh, if you go and add, um, so these, uh, there we go, metrics, right? So we have support for small right metrics. So that means that uh, you can, by just adding an extension, we will automatically have um, the endpoint for Prometheus to get in. And when you add uh, the different extension that has support for small right metrics, they will automatically show up. And that will be available when you do native image too. So, uh, really all, nice. so all the stuff you know from communities is kind of supported out of the box on, on um, in, in, in Caucus. Uh, you have to enable it. It's not there by default, but uh, it's it's like super trivial. Um, and then on, on on top is the we are working on adding uh, flight recorder support, at least partial support to Graal VM, uh, like we did for the debugging. So uh, hopefully you can even you can even use uh, yeah flight recorder to do events and other all other Java goodness on top of the Prometheus and Kubernetes goodness. So Paul asks the next question. Um, he is interested in the size of the Quarkus team at Red Hat. That's a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, uh, maybe Demetrius is on here and can say the, 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 the real number. Um, we are a core, we are a core uh, team of 
I think like five or six, four or five or six. It's not very big. Uh, but the the thing is, all these extensions has been done by uh, the actual real team. So the camel stuff, the camel extensions has been done by the camel team. Um, and the Hibernate, has, the Hibernate team has done the Hibernate one. Um, so it's kind of a lot of all the, a lot of the Java guys we have have been involved in, in, in the Quarkus thing. But this, the, the, the one that works in Quarkus day to day is a very small team. And I don't know the official number because it, it, it changes over day. But uh, it's, it's not a lot. So then let's hope Dimitris is answering it in the chat. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. OK, good. Then let's go to the next question. So Nicola asked um, if you can use Vardin in Quarkus. Vardin is the, um, uh, yeah. so I haven't done it, but I, I actually believe that was the framework. I, someone have combined the two. I don't, I just, I, uh, I do the newsletter for Quarkus and I uh, have it in there. So someone did, but I don't know the level of integration. It was, I, 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 yeah. So yes, you can, but I don't know the level of the integration where they can do native. For that one. And then Michele again wants to know if you can use Lombok um, with Quarkus. Yes, you can. So Lombok is an uh, annotation processor. So if you put those on the class path, they will run. And Lombok, as far as I know, uh, doesn't do anything weird. So it's all it's basically generating at compile time. So therefore, there's no reflection, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, but yeah, it that and that one doesn't require an extension because the code it just generates is is plain static. Uh, so yeah, that should just work. Um, Roman wants to know um, how much additional work does it take to use native image, for example, in real world projects. Yeah. So um, yeah, the answer is depends. But if you're using, if you're not like a framework developer, like you're not writing Hibernate or uh, a little utility, like any reflection kind of thing, and you're just using like business logic, uh, then there should be very little you have to deal with. Um, and like literally nothing. But if you, we've, I've, I've seen some customers who had like, they've written like a little utility library that injects into every method of their business logic to do something, uh, meaning they're doing reflection at runtime, uh, those guys would have to probably write an extension and, and do it. But I would say that if that person could write that library, he probably also can do the code that needs to write for <clears throat> for, for doing the, 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 the native integration. Um, and the cool thing is, and by the way, if you want to explore this, we have a guide on, on Quarkus IO that talks about running extension. And it's a bit, you know, it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's there, it's documented. And I would say start there rather than go and learn about Graal's VMs because Graal's VM, it's, it's good to you learn about Graal's VM, but if you go with Graal's VM and try that one, that there's a lot of details there you don't have to worry about in Quarkus because we've taken care of it. Um, so I would say end user app, very little, that shouldn't be uh, much. Um, if you have like small libraries of dot reflection and, and 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 funny things, then you need some work. Um, but uh, that that's about it. So yeah, it depends on your app. It's the short answer. So Daniel is asking, since um, Quarkus is a fairly new project, what are the biggest parts which are missing, if there are any, right? And what's oh. like coming up in the next versions? Okay. Uh... That's a, that was an awesome question because I haven't ever actually thought about what we're missing because there's so much to be doing. <laughs> um, so the the we have a room. I'm just thinking. Uh, well, so one thing that that we there's some stuff we don't do because we don't want to do it before we get asked for it. <laughs> um, so um, one weakness I'll, I'll say here. Here are the things I've been asked for that we didn't have, but we now have. So uh, one is the command mode or the CLI. That, that's that been until this week, last week, that was not possible. Uh, so the thing you do for batch processing and that kind of thing, but that is now there. So if you've heard people say Quark is only for, for web apps or, or serverless, that's no longer the case. You can write any kind of app in, in Quark now. Um, 
uh, we have all the persistence and, and data sources. So you can have multiple data sources, but unfortunately we can't have, we don't have multiple persistent units right now. Um, so one of the weaknesses we do have is uh, if you want to have a batch program that converts some data from MySQL into Oracle, uh, that is not trivial to do. That is one of the things it's on the to-do list we should do, and I, I expect it to come um, soon in, in, in some form. Uh, we know how to do it. It's just one of the things we didn't want to do until we saw the need. Um, I know there are some things around transactions, uh, uh, distributed transactions was a question that came up the other day. Um, we don't do it because we have to believe that in a in a container environment, you or the microservice world, you want to avoid it. Um, but we do have Arania, but uh, uh, not I forgot what it's called not yet. We have a transaction manager that uh, can do uh, uh, dispute uh, management. We just haven't exposed it. Um, so that, again, there is some PRs for it. It's on its way in some form. Uh, but again, we don't actually recommend you do it. Um, others, I can't. I, I'm drawing a blank here. There, there are stuff you're missing. Um, there's the DB, DB2 and Oracle. It only works in VM mode. We want to get it native. So we, we, we're working with uh, those teams on getting that done. Um, otherwise, there are uh, more Spring APIs. So we, we do some of them, Spring compatibility layer. Uh, we believe that's majority for a lot of applications. Um, and the, the the thing we're doing is right now, we're not adding more until we actually get requests for it. So if you are trying to do something with Quarkus and you go, oh, I'm missing this thing, you know, go to our issue tracker and edit. Um, and another one I've seen people mention is batch. Um, and that one, I don't know if it's planned. I just know we have uh, a batch implementation uh, called JBRA. Uh, but I don't think we have even looked at how much it will take to make that a native player. Um, but you can use Debray in VM mode. Uh, but uh, yeah, so anyway, I, it's a good question. I actually hadn't thought about how much we're missing. Um, we, yeah, so those are the ones I can remember. So. Okay, great. So you're still happy answer, um, answering questions because we have I'm, like about eight questions to go and there are I'm, still I'm, more than 100 in the LM people in the stream. So, sure. Uh, I'll, we can go on. <laughs> then we go on. OK, cool. Um, is Quarkus free? Are there commercial editions? Is asked by Kpeti. Yeah, so uh, yes. So Quarkus is fully open source. Uh, and we have the community edition. And it's released on Quarkus 1.4. And um, there, uh, Red Hat will support a UR on Quarkus. And uh, there, there will be um, Red Hat's business model is that we maintain the, we, we contribute in open source and we we offer support on specific builds on them. And that is um, that is available. Um, and if you go on CoqQuarkus.io, you can find where. That's what, I, that's what I'll say here. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, Peyti is asking, from which country are you from? And Lars cool. also just answered it just below and with another question. He said, you're originally from Denmark. That is true. That's yeah. true. Yes. I've lived in, I moved to Denmark. Oh, sorry, I moved to Denmark. I lived in Denmark the first 30 years. And then uh, when I turned 30, I, um, I moved to, to, to Nishotel uh, 15 years ago. Nice. Um, is there support for Rx Java and Reactor? Uh, yeah. So we have. So I'm not super strong on Reactive, but we have support for Reactive programming. Um, uh, it's based on RxJava, but we have this thing called Mutiny uh, that came out. Oh, that's actually this version now. In Quarkus 1.4, we uh, expanded on it. So yes, there is uh, support for uh, uh, Reactive programming. And we've gone a bit further and added a, a, a layer um, on top of that. OK, so Guido is next. He's asking if there is um, grant support for ARM32. ARM32. So um, so yeah, there is. I don't know actually for 32. I know there's for ARM64. Uh, uh, but for ARM, uh, sorry, no. There, uh, Bob McWhither uh, did a lot from Red Hat, did a lot of work on ARM so they can compile for 
iOS and uh, others. So yes, there is. So for Graal, uh, there is some support. But I just want to highlight for Quarkus, what we are focusing on is the Linux in container. So when we say native, it is we know it can compile and run on Linux. Um, one of the weaknesses Graal has, it doesn't have true cross compilation. Um, so you have to run on Windows to compile on Windows, run on Mac to run a build on Mac, et cetera. Um, but the cool thing is, for example, the CLI. I, there's a, a guy last week who just published, he, he converted his app to, to, uh, to Quarkus, and he has it cross compiled in uh, GitHub Actions targeting Linux, Mac, and Windows. And it's, it's a fully Quarkus app. Um, but I do know there's some things that, that doesn't compile on Windows. Um, but uh, it's getting the, the, the things that are falling out is more a graph thing, and that thing is getting smaller and smaller. So, um, so if you want to try it, uh, it's it's Graal VM uh, twenty. They have uh, they cover more platforms. Okay, nice. Um, Nicolas is asking: Is Quarkus better than Spring Boot for replacing J two E application server frameworks like Wildfly in the context of a cloud migration? Of course, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so um, uh, as a I, I'm colored. I'm I'm coming from a Java E background, and and I like that API, uh, especially the, the latest ones. And I believe Quarkus. Uh, if you're coming from Java E, I think Quarkus is a, a natural choice. If you come for Spring Boot, uh, sorry. If you want to come for a, a Wildfly and stuff, and want to go to Spring Boot, um, I would say that you know, you can of course, uh, but Spring Boot has the same problems as I start talked about in the beginning. Like Spring Boot is part of what I call the white swarms. It's doing things at runtime. It can apply a Graal VM and get to a certain extent, uh, but there's just they they can't do all the build time stuff we do, um, and that manifests in performance at runtime, uh, startup time, uh, etc. But especially on development, like the dev mode we have is unmatched as far as I've seen. I never seen anything on on uh, Spring Boot. Spring Boot has something, but it's it's not anywhere near this. So that's my uh, as unbiased recommendation I can say. <laughs> I don't think that's unbiased, but yeah. <laughs> sure. Oh, sorry. That was the memo. Sorry. That was the biased uh, answer I could do. Sorry. OK. So what are the long-term uh, long plans for Quarkus? What are the things we can expect in the future by Eddie? Oh, yeah. So uh, well, we have. So I, I'm uh, one of the things I'm, I'm focusing on is what, uh, lots of the developer er, 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 developer tooling errors. So first of all, um, more extensions. We are trying to um, make sure that um, uh, other people can do extension easily. Uh, so for example, we don't we don't plan on supporting JSF, uh, but we had a lot of requests for it, and the guys behind my faces has has a JSF uh, uh, thing out there. Um, we have uh, there's like a hazel cast thing coming in. There is um, I'm drawing a blank here, but we have like four or five things that we know about that's coming in. Uh, but otherwise, it's improving the API. So, for example, multiple data sources and p positions we have to do. Uh, but on, for example, on the developer tooling, we have a lot of stuff we can do to improve things, or also even make it better. Um, so we want to have we want to add a CLI. So you don't have to use Maven or Gradle to get started. Um, the, the thing we've done, which actually there are traces off in Quarkus 1.4, is the way we deployment to Kubernetes. So uh, if you take the app I actually showed you here today, the REST thing is a Quarkus app. Uh, you can add your stuff to it. Uh, and you by just adding, uh, a, a, go and say add extension Kubernetes or add extension OpenShift. Uh, there's a one liner to deploy your service to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so all this kind of automatic setup uh, we're doing in Kubernetes. Uh, the same thing is done for Camel. Uh, so this is actually not a new thing. It's just I think people are not aware of it. But the full support for Camel can do all this hardware load. So all if you use use Camel for all the integration stuff, uh, all that fast reload uh, stuff works there. Um, we uh, the actually also this week was announced uh, Funky, which is uh, um, a library a framework in Quarkus 
that uh, allows you to write a uh, you know, REST-based application and expose them as services on Amazon and Azure uh, functions. Um, and that's our attempt to make sure that you can write your app in in Quarkus or uh, and use the you know uh, 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 you know Java APIs, but because we can compile down to a small thing, you can actually run it in in these uh, functions as a service, and you don't have to tie yourself to Amazon and Azure uh, for your deployment. Um, otherwise, uh, a bunch of stuff around the tooling. Um, so we we have. Uh, uh, Eclipse, IntelliJ, VS Code, and Eclipse J. Uh, so you can actually, if you want to try this out and not have to install anything, you can go to j.openshift.io uh, and do all the stuff I just walk you through. Um, and we want to, you know, expand this to more and more stuff in in um, in, in in the ecosystem of what we have in in JBoss and Red Hat. But mainly, we want to try and enable others to to uh, be part of this uh, and be yeah, external extensions. Um, so if you guys are looking for stuff, the best way to do it is I can come and contribute the code uh, for it. But yeah, I think yeah, I feel there's, there's stuff I missed here, but I, my I'm I'm drawing a blank. On that one. So two more questions, okay. and then I think we are done. So what's the power boost difference between using run native and normal bytecode, not native but pre-wired? What's the power boost uh, difference? The difference between, can you do it again, the question? What's the power boost difference between using RAL and normal bytecode? Uh, so the actual ex execution, I, I, uh, well, startup time is about a 7x or, or uh, 50x in some cases. Uh, but at, at when, once the VM starts running hot, um, depending on the app, the VM actually wins. Right? So that's the that's the thing is the VM, the Graal VM can can go from zero to one hundred very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. but the VM requires some time. And then over time, because the JIT can actually see how you run your app, uh, it can actually tweak it a little bit better. Um, but uh, yeah, so today is no. Difference in the long run, but uh, shorter times it, it is it, it has a massive difference. Mm -hmm. I hope I hope I answered the question. I wasn't sure I fully get it, but that was the. That was the... So um, Bernard is asking um, that Qu because Quarkus has almost thousand open issues on GitHub. Does it mean <laughs> you're looking for contributors? Yes, we always look for contributors. So uh, we actually have, so, so I would say we have a very nice problem that we have, a, we've grown in popularity, uh, but our issue tracker not only have issues in there, it also has ideas and uh, feature requests, like a new extensions. Um, but uh, yeah, we know we're like, right now the incoming requests and questions and, and issues is more than the, um, we, we kind of, we, we, we've been around the eight, 900 for a long time. It's slowly going up. Um, but I see that as a good problem. It's not because we're not doing anything. Uh, it's just it's being used very much, uh, a lot. So anyone who wants to contribute and help, uh, anything, even answer questions or do small fixes in documentation, et cetera, more than welcome to reach out. Uh, Dimitris is saying, actually, that you have more than 250 contributors already. Yes. So uh, 250. Uh, that was in November, I think. The number is higher now, now but yeah, two, it's about 250 is the, the number we had last time we counted. And um, Nicolas, again, um, is Red Hat the main contributor to Quarkus? Are there other significant contributors or sponsors? Uh, currently, uh, Red Hat is uh, the, the, the biggest uh, the one. Uh, IBM is there, but IBM is now Red Hat too, but uh, uh, we have uh, IBM uh, guys. Uh, but last time, this was back in November, uh, we had about a 20, I think it was like 30% was done by external contributors. Uh, but and those people are from you know any kind of companies out there in that sense. So, but anyone is Great, welcome. we yeah. are through the list. Thank you. That was long. We're through the list with all the questions. <laughs> yeah, so somebody in the chat mentioned that it was the best talk in a long time. Many thanks. So I think that's actually 
through and especially the Q&A part, I think was probably also like very interesting to hear some insights um, from the from the Quarkus team. So that was really, really nice. Yeah, I'm very happy. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Um, just to mention, like the last few things here from the Java user group side. Um, this was our talk, Quarkus, the Black Swan of Java. And you learned now what actually the Black Swan is. And that spring is the, the white swan, as Max said. Um, oh, I want to thank honestly. you also. <laughs> I want to thank actually um, Max that he jumped in, took the possibility to have the talk online. And then also you, the participants, we had like many showing up here. I think it was more than 250 joining at the beginning. I didn't um, remember the, the correct numbers. And then as well as always, we thank our sponsors who are supporting the Java user group for the events, not only for the events we run in presence, and we hope we can actually do that after the whole crisis again. But I guess also that we will continue this kind of um, format as well in the future, because it shows how many um, people we have. Right. And then actually also the people behind the scenes, like Ursula, which um, supports us um, in the back office, sending out all the emails, making sure that even the last joiners um, got like the email with the link to join big markers. And obviously also Marcos, who is running the whole infrastructure behind the scenes, right? And then the second last thing I want to ask you to please fill out the form at the end. So when you um, sign off, here you are forwarded directly to the feedback form. And actually make sure that you fill out the feedback form because you are able to win a IDEA um, license, right? So make sure you provide us feedback. Thank you very much.